First Thessalonians in the first chapter this morning, we're going to look together at verse 1 through verse number 3. And again, if you're looking at one of our pew Bibles, it's on page 159 in the New Testament. First Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1, Paul and Silvanus, and this is Silas uh, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. And we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. May the Lord add a very special blessing to the reading and the proclaiming of his word. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to uh, a little series by Dr. Johnny Hunt. And Dr. Hunt started relaying something about himself in one of those messages. And I caught myself getting tickled because I could really identify with what he was saying. And uh, it was just something that is very true not only of him, but very true of me. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I grew up in Urban, in Estill County. And it's kind of like a spoon. you got the little town, Urban and Loretta, the little twin, twin town down in the middle. And then all around you, you've got hills. So I was raised a literal hill building. So I grew up in the hills. I grew up in the woods. Uh, we would hunt ginseng, yellow root, and all that kind of stuff. And of course, we, we went hunting, you know, squirrel hunting and coon hunting and rabbit hunting, all that good stuff. So I'm very familiar with the woods. But there's one thing that I cannot do, one thing that I never learned. I can go out in the woods in the dead middle of winter when there's no trees, anything else, or, or no leaves on the trees or anything else. And you can show me the bark of any tree, and I can't tell you what that tree is. I don't have a clue what that tree is. I know the Oose works in the log woods, and I know Mike works in the log woods, and maybe him and Patty or Oose or some of them, they could walk out there and look at one of those trees, and they could tell you exactly what it was by looking at the bark, but I am clueless. I don't have the foggiest notion of what a tree is by looking at the bark. Well, when it comes to vines, vines that grow in the woods, I don't have a clue what that. Now, I know what poison ivy is. You learned that lesson at a young age if you're running around in the woods. So I know what poison ivy is. I know what kutzu is because it just takes everything over, right? I don't know what anything else is. I can look at it all day. I can count the leaves on it. I can look at the, the structure of the vine and, and how it branches out. I don't have a clue. I'm clueless when it comes to that stuff. But here's what I can do. I can use my keen sense of, perspe of perception, and if I'm out walking and I come up on a tree and there are apples hanging on that tree, I can guarantee you I know what that one is. That's an apple tree. That's pretty sharp, isn't it? You can tell I got my edification. I know what that apple tree is. I've been down south. I can come up on a tree with oranges hanging on it. And I can guarantee you that's an orange tree. And as far as vines go, if I come up on a vine and there are concord grapes growing on that vine, I know that's a grapevine. I'm pretty sharp when it comes to that stuff. In other words, when I see fruit hanging on the vine, and when I see fruit hanging on the tree, I know exactly what it is. There's no question about it. It is clear, undeniable evidence when you see the fruit. And I even know what walnut and hickory, I don't know what the nut trees are when there's nuts hanging on them. Now, you know where we're going with this, don't you? The Scripture teaches that everyone who is born again by the Spirit of God will begin to display fruit in their life so that it becomes undeniable that they are a child of God. So what we're going to talk about today is we're, going to, we're actually going to examine our lives today and see if we see the evidence of Christian fruit in our life. And for some of you, you may find out you're a nut tree, you're a little nutty. But, you know, that, that's for you and the Lord to work out. But we want to look for fruit today in our lives. Because as Paul begins in his customary fashion of grace to you and peace, uh, peace the common salutation, and then as he does in, in most of his epistles, he then begins by telling the church he's praying for them. And Paul's prayer here to the Thessalonican church, this very young Christian church, that his prayer for them is a prayer of thanksgiving. All the way over in chapter 3, he just keeps mentioning, thanks to, he's giving thanks to God for what God has done in the lives of these very young Christians. And Paul says one of the reasons he's giving so much thanks to God for their faith is because he knows their faith is real. 
Because Paul says, I can look at your life. I hear about what is happening. Timothy has brought me a report to Corinth, and he's told me what you're doing, and I am thanking God in heaven that he genuinely saved you because there's fruit bearing in your life. Christian fruit. There is holiness. There's Christ-likeness. There's the fruits of the Spirit. There's, there's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. Uh, these things, goodness, faithfulness, they're evidenced in your life. It's obvious by the fruit that you're a Christian. It's obvious that you've been born again. And this is a principle that's taught all throughout the Scripture. That the Christian will be evidenced by their life. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, in verse number 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you. They're wolves. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. And listen to what Jesus said in verse 16. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from bushes, and figs are not gathered from thistles. Are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. And every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad, fruit, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Now, Jesus was not saying that every born-again child of the living God is good perfectly, or that we live a perfect life, or that we are constantly bearing perfect fruit. But what Christ is saying is we ought to be able to examine our lives and look at our lives and see that there has been a change in our life. You cannot come to Christ and enter into the covenant of grace. You cannot be born again by the Spirit of God and have no evidence in your life. If there's been no change, there's been no Jesus. Remember that today. N-O, no. No change, no Jesus. But K-N-O-W, no. If you know Jesus, you will know change. He transforms Everyone he comes to. The miraculous thing about God's work is that he takes folks like you and I who were dead trees, dead branches, dead vines, barren vines, and he breathes into us by his Holy Spirit brand new life, and we become living vines, fruit-bearing vines, lives that are transformed by the grace of God. And the cool thing is God never finishes with us. He is constantly pruning away and taking away everything in our life that doesn't bear Christian fruit. And he is cultivating more fruit of the Spirit in our life. We're always going to be a work in progress. There's always and should always be increasing growth in Christ's likeness for the believer. There's no such thing as the stagnant Christian. There is constantly a war with the flesh, a war between the flesh and the Spirit. But thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, sin no more has dominion over us. And God is in the process of cultivating Christ-like fruit in our life more and more. Jesus said it this way in John 15. I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. You can claim to be a follower of Christ, but if there's no fruitful evidence in your life that God has changed your life, Jesus said that branch is taken away. It's thrown into the fire, but then he says... Thank God every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so it bears much fruit. You are the vine, or I am the vine, you are the branches, and he who abides in me and I in him. He bears much fruit. And by the way, he supplements that with this little closing statement. Apart from me, you can do nothing. How many of you know that if we're going to minister for Christ, if we're going to be Christ-like, if we're going to pursue a life of godliness, holiness, righteousness, we have to cling to Christ. He is our life. He is our strength. He is the source from which we grow as Christians. And that's why Paul can say this. He says, when you come to Christ, if you have truly turned from sin and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, he says salvation is not just about turning from, forsaking, and walking away from sin. It is about God now cultivating a brand new life in you so that you are now walking Another direction, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. That means made brand new. And the person you used to be, the old things are passed away. And he says, behold, that means to marvel. This is amazing. This is a miracle from God. All things have become new. 
Don't let Satan lie to you and tell you you've got to keep thinking the way you've been thinking. Don't let Satan lie to you and tell you you have to continue living the way you've been living. Thank God we're set free from sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are set free to now serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to live for Him and to glorify Him. So as we come to Paul's prayer here, in verse 1 through 3, the beginning of this prayer, the, the, the introduction to his letter, telling him who's writing, telling him he's praying for him. And he says, I'm thanking God for the fruit I see in you. I'm thanking God that when people examine you, Thessalonians, they can see people who are the real deal. He goes on and says they can see people who took their idols that they'd spent their whole lives serving and living for, and they threw them away. They burned them. They cast them out from their homes, and they started following and living for the one true and living God. He said your testimony of goodness and the gospel that is coming forth. Anywhere I go in the world, I don't have to tell people about the third church of the Thessalonians. He said, I mention you, and folks cut me off and say, man, we've already heard about them. They're an awesome church. God's doing great things in their midst. And that's because they had had a true encounter with Christ. Their lives had been changed. Their lives had been transformed by the power of God. And so as Paul expresses his thanks for God, for what God is doing in and through them, he begins mentioning this Christian fruit. He begins talking about what is evidenced in their life. And here, friends, this morning where we as Christians have to pay very careful attention. We must do what Paul says elsewhere and examine ourselves to see whether or not we be in the faith. We need every now and then, we need to do a little fruit inspection. And sometimes it doesn't mean we're outside of the faith. Sometimes it just means that we as Christians... We've stopped focusing on growing in grace and the knowledge of Christ. Amen. Or we have allowed things to come into our life that is hindering the growth of Christian fruit in our life. So Paul goes with some very basic things here. And you're going to see these three terms used not only here, but all over the New Testament. Faith, hope, and love. What great evidences of the Christian life. And I think it's important that we define those real quick. Faith. What is true faith? True faith is just not some abstract thought. True faith is not just, well, I believe there's a God. That's not true faith. True faith is married together with repentance. True faith is penitent faith. You want to say how true faith starts? True faith starts when God, by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, according to the law, you begin to see that you are a wretched sinner. That you cannot save yourself. That you deserve the wrath of God. And godly sorrow overwhelms you because you see what your sin has done. It has separated you from God. It caused the horrific, brutal cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And with sorrow, knowing what your sin has done, thank God the Lord then, in His effectual call, points us to the cross of Christ. And we see the beauty and the splendor of our Lord Jesus. We see one who loved us so much that God the Son left eternal glory, clothed Himself in human flesh, lived the perfect life for us that we could not live, died the death for us that we deserved, took the sum of God's wrath that we had earned, and He paid our debt in full. He conquered hell, death, and the grave, rose again so that where He is, we can be also. Genuine faith looks at Jesus and Him alone and says, I trust you with my eternal soul. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you are absolute Lord, and from this day forward, I am yours. We can sum up true faith with the acronym F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust Him. That's true faith. Oh, what about hope? Hope. And when we hear the word hope, oftentimes we think of we're going to curl up in the corner in the midst of a bad situation and just hope that it works out. Well, that's not a good definition of the biblical term, translated hope. The biblical term, translated hope, we could put it this way, Absolute, unwavering, confident assurance. And hope in the scripture is always in Christ. And it is always tied to eternal glory. 
Now let me tell you something. I, I, I was kidding earlier about trees and, and what I know and don't know, but in reality, there's a whole lot I don't know. There's a whole lot I don't know about God. There's a whole lot I don't know about His Word. Thank God He never quits working on us and never quits teaching us. There's a whole lot I don't know. But there are a few things that I know of absolute certainty. And I have confident assurance that because Jesus Christ conquered hell, death, and the grave, that hell, death, and the grave no longer have a stranglehold on my life. I have confidence that just as Christ rose from the dead, the firstborn among many brethren, that someday I too will raise from the dead. My body will be resurrected because Christ is eternally glorified. Friends, I have confident assurance that when I see Him as He is, I will become as He is eternally glorified just like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my confident assurance. That's biblical hope. But what about love? Oh, the love of God is all sacrificial. It's all giving, expecting nothing in return. And perhaps if there's anything that needs a greater definition today than the love of God, I don't know what it would be. Because we are so confused about God's love. We are so confused about love altogether. I don't think we even know as a culture what love is anymore. And we're going to unpack love a little bit later. Uh, so don't worry about that. We're going to get to it. But in verse 3, Paul now qualifies those things. And Paul says, if Chris has true faith, you're going to see fruits of it. And I pick on Chris because I've seen the fruit. And I know he's got real faith. And I know, I, I look around today and, 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 and I know Miss Brenda's got real love. And I'll tell you how I know that here in a little while. I can tell you what the fruit and the evidence of that love is. And I look around today and I know that there's some people that have real, I know Ed's got real hope. Because I've seen the fruit. I've heard the fruit coming from him. So let's all examine our lives now and see if we've got this fruit. And though imperfect, these things should be a part of our life if we are Christian. So the first one, verse number three, very quickly, your work of faith. Your work of faith. Now the Bible speaks of works in two different ways in the New Testament. It talks about works of the law, and here, the work or the works of faith. What's the difference? What are the works of faith that should be evidenced in our life? I like how Martin Luther, the great reformer, put this. He did a great job distinguishing between works of the law, which are vain, fruitless, and empty. How many of you know there are all kinds of people who don't know Christ, they've never been born again, but looking at them, you think, boy, they're really working for the Lord. Their lives are really exemplary. But they're doing works of the law, which don't benefit and here's what Luther says are the works of the law. The works of the law are works done without faith and grace. When you're doing things without faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, those are vain and empty works. When you're doing things because you're not under the saving grace of God, those are vain and empty works no matter how good or beneficial they may be to the world. So he said they're works done without faith. Listen, they're works done by the law which forces them to be done through fear. If you are avoiding adultery because you're scared of God, that's the wrong reason, folks. If you're avoiding gossiping against your co-workers because you're afraid of God, that's the wrong reason, folks. If you're avoiding murder because you're afraid of God, that's the wrong reason. Fear is not our motivation to serve the Lord. Fear is not our motivation to serve one another in the house of God. Fear is not our motivation to do good works. We're not motivated by fear. All right, and then Luther says, or the enticing promise of temporal advantages. If you got up this morning and said, I'm going to go to church so God can give me something, just because I can get something from it. Well, we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some means. We're told that we're to come here not seeking what we can get, but what we can give. So that we can provoke and encourage and help one another to love and good works. So that we can exemplify Christ. And yes, we come to be fed, don't get me wrong, but it's not just about what can I get. Amen. That's works of law. I'm going to do this stuff so God is obligated to give me stuff. That's works of law. Doesn't benefit anything. Unbelievers can do that. But the works of faith, Luther says, are those that are done in the spirit of liberty 
You're free from the law. You're free from fear. You're free from bondage. You're not bound to obey Christ. You don't feel like this heavy burden to do what God's called you to do. Luther says you're free. There's liberty. And you do the purity out of love for God. I want to obey Christ because of what He did for me. And the more I read of His saving and efficacious work in the New Testament, the more I read of of how he was in that garden with his head bowed, praying to the Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass over me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There was no other way than Christ had to go to that cross and the full weight of my eternal wrath had to be poured out on the Son of God. And he willingly did that for me. Oh, that's a Savior worth loving. When he conquered hell, death from the grave, rose from the dead, was seated at the right hand of the Father as an acceptable sacrifice for Sunday where he is when he can be also, that's a Savior worth loving. And if I'm going to live for him and obey him, it's going to be out of love. Folks, we don't do good works to get ourselves saved or keep ourselves saved. We do good works because of what Jesus did for us. And when someone has genuine faith, they're truly saved. They've truly been born again. As God said in Ezekiel, I will clean you. I will clean you. I will cleanse you, God said in Ezekiel 36. You will be clean. I will cleanse you of all filthiness. He said, I will cleanse you of your idols. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. He said, I will put my spirit in you. And I will listen to this from Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my spirit in you. And cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. In other words, the person who has truly been born again by the Spirit of God, who has the Holy Spirit living in them, that Spirit has changed you. He's changed the way you think. It's not a burden to serve the Lord anymore, to live for Him, to do good works, to honor Christ. It's no longer a burden or a, a heavy weight to come in here and to encourage and minister to and serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's no longer a burden to love others and to do good works because the Spirit of God has changed your heart. And that ought to be evidenced, as James says, just as the body without the Spirit is dead, true faith without the evidence of works is dead. So the question before us today is, has God changed your life? Right. Are you now walking in a new course, a new direction? If other people had to describe your Christian life today, would they describe you as a Christian only in lip or in lip and life? What do I mean by that? Would someone else who's around you a lot, because how many of you know it's easy to be a Christian and do good works in here, right? When we're all together, this is easy. But what about someone out there in the world that's around you a lot? Would they look at you and say, well, he claims to be a Christian, but he sure doesn't live like one. And we're not living to impress the world. The friends, the world should be able to look at us and see the fruit of true faith in Christ in our life. They should be able to see a changed life in us. Again, where there's no change, there's no Jesus. But look at the second one. Paul mentions love, but notice what he says, labor of love. The word labor here is a little bit different than the term work. The word labor here speaks even more of the motivation behind what you're doing. In other words, what we do for Christ, our obedience to Christ, our obedience to the commands of God, they're not birthed out of restraint. They're birthed out of love. Love should then be evidenced in our life, Galatians 5.22 speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. What's the first one, folks? The fruit of the Spirit is love. The very first one. Romans 5.5, here's how I know you're a Christian. Because there's true love in your heart that's evidenced in your life. Because Romans 5.5 says that Spirit of God who's given to us, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the person by which we are born again. But the Holy Spirit of God, when He's given to us, Romans 5.5 says this. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit that was given to us. If your love hasn't changed and the love of God is not evidenced in your life, then there's a real problem with your heart. Listen to this. The love of God that's in us, here's how it expresses our, itself. First of all, towards our church family. We're not just commanded to love each other. We should love each other. 
we should just have a natural affection and to care for one another. First uh, John three fourteen. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. And he who does not abide in love abides in death. I know today one of the evidences in my life as a Christian. I know that that is there because I love it, my church family. I don't love you perfectly. Are there times that we get frustrated with one another? We hurt one another's feelings and we say and do things to each other we shouldn't? Sure. But we forgive each other. We reconcile with each other because God has put His love in our heart for our church family. And not just our church family, but Christians everywhere. That's why we partner with, with ministries in the Dominican Republic and in Cuba and, and in South Africa and ministries right here in America through disaster relief is because we love the brethren and we want to be part of what God's family is doing. We love and we care for each other, but we also have a love toward unsaved people. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 says, we're going to get to this later, but the Lord calls you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. And how do I know what is the fruit, the evidence that we love all people? Because we take the good news of Jesus Christ to them. Don't tell me you love your lost family and friends if you are neglecting to pray for them, to live Christ-like in front of them, to be a witness to them, and to find some way to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. That's the evidence of love for the lost. And by the way, the evidence, the evidential fruit of love for our church family is that we serve one another. We look out for one another. We pray for one another. We show up for one another. When, when somebody in our midst has a need, I, this has been one of the greatest blessings to me and be, getting to just be a part of this church family. When there is a need that is mentioned here, it doesn't matter how big or how small that need is. And we pass that plate around. How many of you know that we have just blessed one another's socks off at times? Gone above and beyond to meet the needs of one another. That's fruit. That says we love you. And sometimes when some of us don't have anything material to give, we show up with a hug and a prayer and just checking on you, bringing a hot meal. We display our love. We prefer others before ourselves. We try to help others and encourage others. That's love, and we also love the lost when we take them Christ. But friends, and this may be the tough one, God loved us and forgave us of our sins. Do you realize we're called to even love our enemies? Well, that was tough, isn't it? That's difficult. But Jesus said, you heard that it was said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We leave vengeance to the Lord. We let Him take care of things. And we pray that our enemies would get saved and they won't be our enemies anymore. But God's called us to love even our enemies. And of course, this is all birth, dear friends, from what should be our primary love. Our primary focus, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. I love how Paul says it in Ephesians 6.24. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Now we know we don't love Him perfectly, right? We don't serve Him perfectly, right? But we love Him. And we serve Him. And we worship Him. And we read of Him. We learn of Him. <coughs> and we commune with Him. And the point of this text, Paul says... That love becomes the motivation for all things we do, for the labor of love. That true love is defined by what we do. I can tell you that I love you. But if Cody comes to me and he says, Boy, Madison done whooped me and run me out of the house. I got nowhere to sleep. I got nothing to eat. And I can barely move because she just whooped a tarnation out of me. I can look at him and say, Cody, I love you. I'll pray for you. Hope it works out. That's not love, is it? Love says, come on in. We'll, we'll dress you up a little bit. We'll give you somewhere to sleep. We'll put some food in your belly. We'll beat your belly. True love expresses itself in action. I can tell someone I love them, but I need to display that love in acts of kindness and goodness. Paul described that love, 1 Corinthians 13. If you've ever been to a wedding, you know the text. I've done hundreds of weddings, and I've read this many times. I know it in the sleep. But how many of you know the evidence, the labors of love? First of all, it's patient. That's difficult, isn't it? Love is patient. It's hard to be patient. We have to pray for patience. But the idea for the biblical term of patience is endurance. Steadfastness. Not giving up. Some of us love people and we just can't give up on them. 
That doesn't mean we don't have to make some tough decisions and do some tough things, but it's still birthed out of love. Because love endures, love is patient. And love is kind. It's not jealous, it's kind. Now there's a good jealousy. We should be jealous for God, the things of God. Jealous for our family. There's a good jealousy we could make the argument for. But the point here is kindness. We express ourselves in kindness for one another. Don't tell me you love folks if you're meaner than a scrapping snake to them. Love is kind. Love doesn't brag. It's not arrogant. It's not all about me. It puts others first. It doesn't act unbecoming and nasty towards people. It doesn't just seek its own. It's not easily provoked. It's not constantly holding the grudge and taking into account everything that everybody's ever done against. That's not love. And love, I love this in 1 Corinthians 13, 6. And this is why some of you may be here today because you need to hear this. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. There are Christians, people claiming to be Christians, that are walking streets and holding signs and taking part in parades that are celebrating what God calls immorality. They say, oh, we're just, we love these folks. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It does not rejoice in it. But rather, love rejoices in truth. We do love people who are separated from God. We do want to minister to them. We do want to be a good witness. We do want them to know that we love them and that we'll be here for them. But we do not condone evil. That's not love. That's sentimental hypocrisy, according to Paul to the Romans. That's just sentimentalism. That's not God's real love. God's real love wants to get the truth to people. God's real love sees sin in someone's life like a copper hand in a baby bed. If you knew, if you went home tonight and your precious child or grandchild or maybe great-grandchild, there was a copper head in their baby bed, would you not do everything you could to warn them about that? Because you love them? That's real love. That's God's love. And that love will come out in the way we treat others. So don't tell me today that you love the Lord if you neglect worshiping Him, you don't obey Him, you don't want to read about Him, you don't want to serve Him. Because love will be evidenced. Don't tell me you love your church family if you don't pray for them. You don't want to encourage them. You don't want to do what you can to help them. Don't tell me you love the lost if you won't share Christ with them. Because love will express itself in a labor of love. Well, finally, third one in verse 3, steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me break this down real quick. Hope again is confident assurance. Confident assurance. And it's very important that you see that our confident assurance is not in ourselves. I do not have confident assurance that I will enter into eternal glory because I'm a swell person or I've lived a good life or I've done some religious things. My confidence is not in me because my heart and my flesh fail. In me that is in my flesh there dwells no good thing. I have no confidence in my flesh in me. I have no confidence in my church membership. I thank God that I get to be a part of what I believe is just the greatest church everywhere. And I brag on you folks all the time. I, can I just pause and say this this morning? How awesome it is, is it for some of us who've been in church our whole, for, for years and years, how awesome it is, is it to walk into a place where there's unity and love and peace and nobody fighting and bickering and arguing over stuff that don't thank God for the unity of peace, the bond of love, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our church. That we love and care for each other and we just get along. Thank God for that. But I don't think I'm going to heaven because I go to a good church. My confidence is not in our church. It's not in my baptism. It's not in the fact that, that God has chosen to use me to proclaim His Word. But my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I will not trust the sweetest frame, but I will wholly lean on Jesus' name. For it's on Christ the solid rock I stand, and all other ground is sinking sand. My hope of salvation, my confident assurance that I'm saved, is because Christ died for my sins conquered hell, death, and the grave, rose from the dead. In Christ, 
He is my substitute punishment. He took my punishment. He's my substitute perfection. I am clothed in his righteousness by faith alone in Christ alone. Thank God for Jesus. I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. My confidence is in him. My trust is in him. My assurance is in him. And how do I know that I'll have eternal glory? Because he's my federal head. He is my resurrection. He is my eternal glory. And I love how Paul puts it. Steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Steadfastness of hope. Can I share something with you all? There are moments we all doubt. I'll say it since some of us don't feel comfortable saying it. We all go through moments of doubt, don't we? We all go through moments of, uh, of, of uncertainty. But by the way, let me just, some of you may have come here to hear this. Jesus Christ will leave the 99 to go get the one sheep that went away. If you're his sheep, he said, I will lose none of them. I thank God for that because I've done some straying in my days. And we'll do it again before I leave this world, I'm sure. But thank God he doesn't lose his sheep. Thank God he comes for us. Thank God when we are faithless, he is faithful. Blaine and I were talking about that recently, and that's one of the things that blesses both of our hearts. He promises when we're faithless, he's faithful. So, though there will be times of wavering and uncertainty, it always comes back to Christ. God, by His Spirit, always convicts us and chastises us and points us right back at the cross so that we hold on to Him. There is steadfastness in our hope. And by the way, if there is steadfastness in our hope, it will display itself. If we truly believe that Christ is coming again, if we truly believe that we will stand before Him, if we truly believe that we can die at any moment and stand before God, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 through 13 says, The grace of God appeared bringing salvation to all men and instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus.